Good afternoon, members of the media, wider viewing and listening public of Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to this week's post-cabinet media conference. The first thing I'd like to do is take this opportunity on behalf of all of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, including yourselves, to congratulate our team that is representing us so ably and so well and in such medal-winning form and fashion in the Commonwealth Games that are taking place in Australia right now. And the latest addition to our medal count today is that of Mr. Jareem Richards, and we congratulate him on his gold medal performance. Of course, we had another gold medal performance earlier this week with uh, Michelle Ayi and Mr. Dylan Carter willing, winning a silver in the swimming pool. So may our athletes continue to do well, do us proud, and on behalf of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, we thank them for bringing this sense of pride that we all have in our sporting achievements at the Commonwealth Games. The second point I'd like to talk about is that the Prime Minister will be leading a delegation from Trinidad and Tobago, leaving on Sunday, and we will be returning the following Tuesday, leaving this Sunday. Next week is Chogam, Commonwealth Head Heads of Government Conference in London, England. So the Prime Minister will be leading a contingent that would include the Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs and myself. Whilst in London, the Prime Minister, as has become his usual modus operandi, will be utilizing the opportunity to fit in as many meetings as possible, outside even of the official circumstances and the official meetings associated with Chogam. So next week, Monday and Tuesday, the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries, Minister Khan, will be joining our delegation as well. And we will be leading a contingent of Ministry of Energy personnel and the President of NGC to meetings with both BP and its executives, as well as Shell in London. You all would recall at the Energy Spotlight not too long ago, we told the country about how we intended to have discussions with some of our upstreamers and in particular those who participate in LNG and the major ones being BP and Shell. Those conversations will commence when we travel to London next week on Monday and Tuesday. The Prime Minister will lead us in those discussions. I can report today that our international lawyers have been retained, our international advisors have been retained. The Minister of Finance, the Minister of Energy and myself met with them earlier this week and we have begun formulating the strategy as to how we will lead the charge on behalf of Trinidad and Tobago to ensure that we extract the best possible outcomes and the best possible returns for the people of Trinidad and Tobago in our conversations with some of these companies, including Shell and BP, who, as I say, the Prime Minister will meet with and lead a delegation next week, Monday and Tuesday. The Prime Minister would also be using the opportunity whilst we're there for us to hold discussions at a very, very high level with the international security and intelligence personnel in the United Kingdom for a number of strategic reasons. That will also take place whilst we're in London. There will be a number of security meetings. As you're aware, a lot is going on on the global front. This administration has been leading the charge and also very strong in its posture when it comes to dealing with issues such as corruption, issues such as countering terrorism and the likes. So those meetings will also take place whilst in London. The Prime Minister will be participating as a head of government, a Commonwealth head of government, over a number of days in a number of forum and discussions with the various heads of other Commonwealth nations. During this Chogam period, he will also be having discussions with heads of other Commonwealth nations, I am sure in the bylines and in the margins, to, to really try and prosper and, and progress Trinidad's and Trinidad and Tobago's position with a number of other matters on the international circuit. The Prime Minister has also is also going to be hosting and having discussions with our diaspora whilst we're there. This has been arranged by our High Commissioner, His Excellency Orville London, who is our High Commissioner in London for Trinidad and Tobago. We are arranging high-level meetings with our diaspora whilst there. The Prime Minister will also participate in, in those meetings and discussions. So we expect that when the Prime Minister leaves on Sunday and we arrive in London on Monday, a very busy schedule 
that will include not only the program that has been put forward by Chogam, but also, as I've said, meetings with our energy industry players, BP and Shell, our security partners out of the United Kingdom, and also the diaspora. The Prime Minister will return on Tuesday, I believe it is the 24th of April, and the delegation will return with him. So the official delegation will be the Prime Minister, the Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, who is actually right now leading a delegation at the Summit of Americas taking place in Peru along with Minister Hines. And the Minister of Energy will join the Prime Minister and myself for discussions with the energy companies Shell and BP whilst we're there in London. At this stage, I will open up the floor for any questions that you may have. <coughs> Jewel. Uh, Jewel Long, TV6 News Minister. I'm just wondering, in terms of the, the Prime Minister, uh, the decision he took to revoke the appointment of Mr. Smith as Minister in the Ministry of Housing. Does the Prime Minister plan to appoint anyone else as Minister in the Ministry of Housing, or will the Prime Minister retain the entire portfolio from now on? As you are aware, and as we've said on a number of occasions within recent times, every ministerial appointment is within the sole discretion of the Prime Minister. At this stage, the Prime Minister, as you rightly remind us, is holding, in addition to his responsibilities as Prime Minister, the portfolio of housing and urban development, he will continue to do so until he sees it fit to make any adjustment, if he sees it fit to do so. Mr. Young, on the, uh, I'm Carl Rajla from the Newsday. Um, on the issue with the revocation, did public outcry have anything to do with the Prime Minister's decision to remove Mr. Smith? I think he's made it very clear that that is not how this Prime Minister operates. What this Prime Minister did on the basis of what was outside there and in public, the Prime Minister did a certain level of investigation. He had the Minister of Planning and Development go and do some preliminary investigation. The Prime Minister always acts on the basis of facts and evidence. He then acted on that basis as he's told us and then took a further precaution of appointing an investigating committee, a three-lady investigating committee, and we'll await the outcome of their report. So the deliberate choice, um, a three-woman panel? I don't know if it was... Well, it had to be deliberate because it was not a, a capricious um, decision. And he has chosen three persons who have very specific... Feel fields that they operate in, and we will await the outcome. Can you explain exactly what this committee is supposed to do, considering the fact that the Prime Minister already has information from a report that the Climate Planning Minister prepared? Well, if you are aware of how reports and investigations are done, you always have a preliminary first report where information is brought to you. The Prime Minister, in his discretion, his experience, and his wisdom, so it necessary to appoint a committee, an independent committee, to go and dig a little deeper. It is surrounding the circumstances with the what appears to be a dismissal or a termination or departure, to use all of the possible phrases, of a former minister, a former Ministry of Sport official. And the Prime Minister has asked that this committee go and investigate that and see what further they can find. The press reported that sources said that there were other allegations similar to the one against Mr. Smith. Can you confirm that? The media always report allegations and are always the source of a, of, of a set of information. On this instance, I would prefer and I would caution, let us await the outcome of those who have been given the task of investigating this Minister particular of, incident. Minister, um, yesterday of. you told the um, Karen Kose, Phillips News. Um, I'm just wondering how effective will this committee be since yesterday you told the Senate that there are no terms of reference for I you. did not tell the Senate that yesterday. The Senate asked me if I could tell them what the terms of reference are, and I said no, I couldn't. Obviously, the reason why I couldn't is I didn't have the terms of reference in front of me. They, of course, then began to spun, and this obviously set foot. They are the ones who then, i.e. the opposition, began to say there's no terms of reference. There are, obviously, terms of reference. I personally have not seen the terms of reference, but I am certain the terms of reference would be along the general lines of what I've just outlined, which are that the Prime Minister has asked this committee to go and investigate the circumstances surrounding the termination, but then also what happened after that. Another issue in the, in the 
uh, the Smith case is non-disclosure agreements to settle pub to settle issues using public funds. Can you give an expanded comment because that was mentioned in the Prime Minister's <coughs> re original release that it will be Ag looked agreed. At. So those would be some of the circumstances surrounding how this whole matter was handled. It would be, I assume, what was the agreement derived at? Why was there termination? What happened? Was there a non-disclosure agreement? Who gave the advice, etc.? I don't want to preempt anything. I certainly don't speculate. So let us await. There's a two-week time frame. Let us await the outcome of that report where persons have been specifically tasked go and find out what are the circumstances surrounding all of this. The Attorney General's Office involvement in that non-disclosure agreement still remains unanswered. Can you shed any further light on that? At this stage, I can't. As I had indicated earlier in this week, I had no personal knowledge myself. I can only speak about that which I know. I had no personal knowledge or any personal um, participation in any of this. I first came into it when I was asked to answer a question, an urgent question in the House and outline the pro policy and procedure with respect to the settlement of matters. I am certain that all of that will be investigated. There is a very experienced attorney at law participating in the investigation panel on that committee. That's Ms. Elaine Green. Is the Attorney General's office normally consulted on something like that? The Attorney General's office is an office that provides legal advice to all aspects of the government. So it is not at all abnormal or unusual for the Attorney General's office to be consulted by other ministries in, in specific circumstances related to law. So when there's litigation involved, it will not surprise me, and nor is it abnormal or unusual for the Attorney General's office to have been approached, if even it is, can you recommend a lawyer who can provide advice in these circumstances? No counsel was used in the sport case, right? Who would have to approve external counsel? Wouldn't that have to come to cabinet or at least the attorney it general? It definitely doesn't come to cabinet. If external counsel is used, there are instances and circumstances where the particular ministry and ministries can retain counsel. I mean, they always need legal advice in almost every aspect of life. So every ministry can do it. But there are also certain circumstances where the attorney general's office, as I just said, is asked to advise who should the counsel be used in specific circumstances? If there's litigation, the Attorney General's office is usually approached by the ministry, by PS to PS, as to, so the PS in this case from the Ministry of Sport may have written to the PS at the Attorney General Legal Affairs Office to ask, can you recommend? Or that may not have happened. Neither would be an unusual circumstance. But again, you're asking me to delve into the realm of, realm of speculation, which I am not going to do. Let us await the outcome of the investigation. During the nature of the allegations, does the uh, government think it appropriate for him to remain as the MP for Diego Martin Central? These are allegations that I am, I don't know if you all are getting me, you know. Let us await the outcome of an investigation to see you all are all going down a road where you're pres presupposing that there's been wrongdoing on the part of Minister Smith. I don't know who has been participating in any wrongdoing. I, as a person, would prefer to await the outcome of a report where an investigative committee has been set up to look at the specific circumstances. At this stage, Minister Smith continuing as the MP for Diego Martin Central does not come into play whatsoever. As a minister then? Is that a c an option? As I say, let us await the outcome. If, he, if there is an outcome where there's a complete absolution and it is found that the minister didn't participate in anything that will then fall within the discretion of the prime minister as to what decision he takes respond to the view that whenever there is a situation like this that the prime minister resorts to a sort of external committee for example with the ferry matter he appointed um, with the smith matter he is appointed this committee with the Moses matter. He's appointed Christopher Thomas. That there is a willingness to frontally, um, you know, address the problem, especially if it involves persons in the cabinet that people feel he, he has confidence in. To me, it is the only way to do it properly. You all would recall not so long ago. 
certain allegations were made by a very high public office holder, a solicitor general, about something that was taking place in the office of the Attorney General. The then Prime Minister, who's now the leader of the opposition, responded to that when allegations were being made about the office of the Attorney General by saying, Attorney General, investigate yourself. In an instance like this, the Prime Minister has shown time and time again that one, he will not be influenced by speculation. He will not be influenced by just plain allegation. The only way that someone can gather the proper facts and evidence upon which to act must be the outcome of an investigation. I am certain that if the Prime Minister asked another minister or uh, he himself went to investigate allegations surrounding one of his ministers or high public office, the allegation that would then be made is, but you're investigating yourself, you're protecting. So by going to persons who have experience, persons who have expertise, and asking them to conduct an independent investigation, that has to be best practice, and actually that is something that should be completely endorsed because the Prime Minister is asking persons of expertise. In the case of what happened at the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, he has gone to someone whose whole career has been in the Foreign Service and said, please take a look at what has happened here, take a look at the procedures, the policies, what failed, what didn't fail, and make recommendations as to what, what should be done. That has to be best practice. The same thing has happened here. He's appointed a three-lady investigative team with the right um, asset sets, the, uh, a lawyer, etc., etc. Please go and investigate this and bring back a report. With the Christian Mute, you had somebody who has a great level of expertise. We've seen the product of his report where he says, look, these are the facts and circumstances surrounding it. So this is, in my view, a very good practice and procedure to adopt because then we cannot, as a government, be accused that there's any cover-up or anything untoward because independent people have been tasked and thankfully accepted the, the tasking to go and do their investigations. The Prime Minister, or are you able to say at the very least, if the Prime Minister informed the Cabinet what the new information was that led to his decision to have Mr. Smith's appointment revoked from the Cabinet? As you all are aware, what goes on in Cabinet is secret. I can say that, yes, the Prime Minister did have a discussion with us at Cabinet this morning as to what it is that took place. Can the population expect the Prime Minister to give any sort of statement or explanation with regard to that information to the public anytime soon? I think at the appropriate time, and as I've said, that the Prime Minister has asked for a report to be done within a two-week period. You know he's travelling on Sunday, coming back the following week. I feel certain, having seen how the Prime Minister operates, I mean, look at the Christian Mute report. That is the first time you've had a Prime Minister go submit himself or herself, himself in this case, to a Joint Select Committee of Parliament in a public setting, and he laid the Christian Mute report there. In fact, it astounded me that I heard some members of the media earlier this week on radio yesterday asking the question in an accusatory manner, is that report public, that Muti report? The answer is yes. Thankfully, somebody on the panel was able to say the Prime Minister, as he received it, laid it in Parliament, and it is now a public document. So I can expect that in this instance, when the Prime Minister receives the report, and if he has any decisions to take, he will tell us, the public and citizens, what it is that has been found. I don't know if you will make the document public or not. Certainly as one of the legal advisors of the cabinet, one of the things I always caution is you have matters of privilege. If there's action to be taken coming out of reports, you may not make a report public because you may want to keep it for the purposes of action to be taken. Let us wait, let us not speculate, let us see what the report says, what is the outcome of the investigative process, and I am certain that the Prime Minister will address us on it public service or are they being paid for um, compiling this report? The vast majority of these committees just give of their service and on a pro bono matter. As I say, I have not seen the particular terms of reference in this instance. So I, I don't want to again speculate as to whether they're being paid or not. I didn't want to speculate, but if this happened to be a criminal matter, what, what then? Just the usual criminal proceedings? You all will file a report with the police? Um, is there a statute of limitations for, 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 a crime, for well, a crime like this if it were, you know... Well, as you rightly point out, Ms. Bridger, I'm not willing to speculate. But what I can tell you, there are limitation periods for criminal charges to be laid. 
and I don't want to speculate in this instance. I am again sure that if the report goes in any direction, that the Prime Minister will send it in whatever direction it needs to go in. Yes, then, give me a break there. Um, the ruling by the High Court today that basically called the buggery law, which is part of the Sexual Offences Act, um, uh, void. Um, do you, does the government have a comment? Did it come up in um, cabinet today? It didn't come up in cabinet today. When we're in cabinet, we have no access. We, we leave our phones outside. There's no electronic access. So it was as I was walking into this room, the Attorney General informed me that the case to which you refer has the judge has ruled against the state. I don't know what the particular circumstances are, but I can tell you that he has given, he, the Attorney General, has given instructions that the matter be appealed. Okay. Um, if it goes uh, through the appeal. Just one, one at a time, one at a time. So then, in other words, the government is taking a position that it wants to maintain. The I prefer that those questions be uh, directed to the Attorney General at the appropriate time because I don't know anything about the matter whatsoever. I told you as I wa was walking in here, the Attorney General informed me that the judge had ruled, I think, against his state. That's what I've just heard you all say. And he told me that he has given instructions that the matter be appealed. You know what is the, the flow of the state appealing the matter. But I don't even know what are the specifics as to what was the case being argued be before, before the court. Please give the government's general position on the issue of this particular law. What particular law? The law buggery. Does the government have a position on that issue? Does it plan to look at that law? Uh, the again, are calling for the government to repeal the law. Again, what I've heard today and what we know is going on, there was an active matter before the courts. That matter has now been decided at first instance. The Attorney General has given instructions that it be appealed. I assume that what was put before the court would have been the state's position. I am not familiar with it whatsoever. Ask us, we're in the realm of the court now. Um, when exactly will the Ministry of the Attorney General be responding to the pre action protocol letters from the leader of the opposition regarding the vacancies in Barataria and Belmont for those by elections? Okay, I, again, this is news to me that the leader of the opposition, what? She sent a pre action letter, the opposition has sent a pre action letter uh, with respect to the, the vacancies and no date being called for the by election. Uh, I don't know about those pre-action letters. It sounds like folly to me because there is every intention that the by-elections are going to take place. The legal advice was there was no time frame within which it had to be called as opposed to, for example, a by-election in a seat of, in the House of Parliament or one of the constituencies. But the elections will be called, as, as you're aware. Your own legal experience would you therefore say that these that I think that's politics. Was, was I think that's just a grand a grand charge and I think as we see it as a papi show and the the cabinet will announce the dates for the by election and there's no time frame within which it was to be. Just go back to your Shogun statements. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned on the sidelines that one of the things that the Prime Minister will be doing there'll be talks with security on security matters. Are any of these talks based, have any relation to the meetings which you had, which the Prime Minister had with a few of our ambassadors related to the existence of possible an ISIS cell here? No, these, these conversations are ongoing conversations. The last time that the Prime Minister and myself were in London, which was when it was Prime Minister Cameron and he had an anti-corruption summit, we utilized the opportunity to introduced Trinidad and Tobago at a very high level to the British security and intelligence system and it is really all about relationships and keeping those doors open because as today's globe and, and, and the climate goes you want to always ensure that you have open channels of communication should we need to be informed of, of, of issues or want to inform of issues ourselves. So it's more of a continuing dialogue and not something which happened recently as in this particular matter that I'm referring Cur to. It is always a continuing dialogue. Just to go back to the, um, well, the buggery case, but is, is constitutional reform something that the government is considering? Because that was one of the, I mean, you did say you are not aware, but it was one of the fundamental arguments that buggery is unconstitutional given the Bill of Rights. But then there's the part of the Constitution that saves the um, existing Which laws. is why I don't want to speculate at all. 
because I don't know what the case is about. And un unless I've read the papers, meaning the, the proceedings that are filed, I'm not going to delve into a discussion with the case whatsoever. Because exactly as you say, <laughs> and, and ironically, I was actually, my first case that I went to at the Privy Council was the case of Matthews, which was all about the death penalty and the savings law provision. So I'm very familiar with the law, but I don't know what, was the, uh, what were the arguments before the court in this instance. So I'm not going to get in it whatsoever. I'm certain that at the appropriate time, you all will find the Attorney General and he will be more than willing to answer those questions. Just speaking about issues concerning court proceedings, the opposition is calling on the Prime Minister to take action concerning Minister Dillon in light of reports my colleague Mark Bassant has been reporting on the issue of uh, the non-disclosure, whether in fact he had broken it. Uh, the relative of the person involved is saying that the court actually ordered Mr. Dillon to take specific actions, repay a certain amount, have no business with the person, and so on. Uh, has this caught the attention of the cabinet, the prime minister? It formed no part of cabinet discussions. That is a matter that is personal to Min Minister Dillon. I can tell you, and I saw it being reported on television, I found it quite ironic because the person whom it appeared Mark Bassant was interviewing um, I believe I'm Miss Neville Piper. I don't know what the court proceedings are there, but if there's a gag order, it seemed to me that she was in breach of the gag order because she got into very specific discussion as to what she claims went on. But again, this is a personal and private matter to Minister Dillon. When I spoke to him today, he told me that he's asked his lawyers in the United States to look into it. And again, he would be the person best placed to deal with any specifics because I don't know what the matter is about. It relates to the athlete's performance. Is the government considering any sort of uh, reward for the performance of those games? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the government is considering a holiday, no. But quite um, fortuitously, not so long ago, the government, and I think it's actually within the last two months, has approved a rewards policy for athletes and the circumstances within which and the amounts and the types of rewards that would be given to athletes. And I think this falls directly into, into that policy. So I can say with a level of certainty that the athletes will be rewarded by Trinidad and Tobago, and that policy will now dictate what the rewards will be. Can you give us any examples of what those types of rewards I, are? I was trying to remember it as I was coming in here. Their monetary sums, so we've said at certain games, the Olympics in ath athletics being the highest, that would be the same thing for swimming, it's a certain amount, this not being an Olympics, world championships, including championships like Commonwealth, is a tear down, I can't remember, but I think it might be 50% of what we've agreed to for Olympics, and I don't, I, I don't want to try from memory to recall what the specific amounts are, but they're, they're predominantly cash rewards. Okay. Did the Prime Minister have any conversation, or this disclose that he did, any conversation with President Weeks concerning what happened yesterday in terms of that uh, statement online, the plot release, and her expressing her dismay and her distress over what she called a fabrication uh, that it she is. made it, that she, the, pri the President, made it clear that she did not refuse to appoint Minister Smith? Mr. Smith, when he was being appointed as Minister. Discussions between the Prime Minister and Her Excellency the President are confidential, and that is between the Prime Minister and the President, so I am not getting into that whatsoever. As you've raised that issue, I think yesterday was a very instructive day for us in Trinidad and Tobago, because what we saw start off our day was fake news, and we all know where that fake news came from, and the quarters where that fake news originated. You then had a body that is an NGO hold on to it, believe it is real news, take a position based on it that then unfortunately brought the office of the presidency into the, the, the fray where of course there was no truth to it whatsoever. Her, Her Excellency's office then told us, the public, that there is no truth to this whatsoever. She did not for a moment refused to carry out the request of the Prime Minister with respect to ministerial appointments. <laughs> what then happened to me as a person and as an individual I found most astounding. Rather than an unconditional apology or position taken, we had that NGO and the President and co-founder of that NGO 
put out a most convoluted statement which doesn't seem to collate with the facts as I read it. But again, I leave that for the population to decide as to what it is that went on there, what is the cover-up, and what are the circumstances that then should flow coming out of it. What quarters um, the fake Plot. news came from? Yeah. Or what quarters the fake news? I am very, I, I am certain <laughs> that you as members, members of the media know exactly where it came from. Because I am also certain and know for a fact that those quarters, on a daily basis, a former minister of the UNC government gives you all a lot, a lot, a lot of um, messages. So that's where it's coming from? I don't know. Just that's what I suspect. You said you were certain. You said well, I am certain that it came from a mischief maker. Let me put it that way. Uh, minister, also, um, the situation concerning uh, what happened with our three Tri and Tobago uh, fishermen uh, that led to their detention in Caracas and so on. They were supposed to be in court. In Venezuela. Them. In Venezuela, yes. Uh, what, I know you have spoken to this uh, over the weekend, but does this issue really cause the government any concern when you have uh, these allegations or incidents of the Guardia Nacional entering our waters without permission and detaining people? The Minister of National Security addressed this frontally in the Senate yesterday. I, I was sitting next to him, so I heard his responses. The Ministry of National Security is raising or having conversation and communications with its colleagues on the Venezuelan side. It is something that they have been having discussions about. Yes, obviously, as a sovereign state, we are concerned if the allegations are true that persons come into our waters and detain persons in our waters. As the release from the Ministry of National Security said last week, that is in breach of international law of the sea. And uh, we have a good relationship with our Venezuelan colleagues. And he, the Minister of National Security said he will bring it up at his level, as well as the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. Uh, speak about the Ministry. Any update at all concerning the review by former Ambassador Thomas in terms of what happened with the the, OS concerning the documents were delivered to him on Saturday last, as well as with the, the terms of reference of what he's being asked to do, and I know he's working on it. Whilst I have this opportunity, something dawns on me, and I'd like to just put it out there. Next week, and the Ministry of National Security is going to deal with this frontally. I know they have already had a press conference on it. Next week, we will have in Trinidad and Tobago, and they've already started arriving a number of personnel from the US military and other agencies in the United States conducting along with our law enforcement, our Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force and other arms of our law enforcement apparatus, a number of exercises. These exercises are not to alarm the public. They are routine exercises that we're quite fortunate to have take place in Trinidad and Tobago because it provides us with a level of experience that we have been working hard and requesting of the United States government as the, from the day we came in as an administration. We have thought it very useful for us to rebuild our relationships with countries like the United States, United Kingdom, France, Holland, um, and others. And this is one of the outcomes of that exercise. I expect that there will be mischief makers who try to turn this into a different conversation, a different narrative, and say this is an exercise to deal with what took place over Carnival, etc. There is no correlation between the two. This is a routine operation that we're very fortunate to have taking place in Trinidad and Tobago to, prov to provide us with training, expertise, and the experience as to how to deal with certain situations going forward. And it also, of course, builds a uh, a stronger bond between ourselves and one of our allies. And no correlation between exercises such as this and the concerns of foreign terrorist fighters, uh, Trinidadians being linked to ISIS? No, because we already have things in place. We have procedures in place, training in place to deal with, with instances of that. But every bit of more experience must assist Trinidad and Tobago. And I, I say that because we saw recently a publication in Argos, which is an international publication dealing with energy, suggesting a link and a correlation 
between the two. And we think, as an administration, that is very, very irresponsible. Again, we are aware of who wrote the article and the connection that that person has with a former Minister of Energy, which is where we suspect it came from. So I'm just saying next week's exercises have nothing to do with that. Next week's exercises actually took over a year of planning and preparation to take place. Was that specific claim ever investigated or being investigated? Well, there's nothing to investigate because we are constant contact with persons in the multinationals who have invested in our energy sector. And part of our conversation will always be if they have any security concerns or if we have any security concerns. And the answer is no. In fact, quite a number of them contacted us to ask, what is this article about? It's being suggested that we are doing X, Y, and Z. Do you know where? And when we told them where it's from, they understood the mischief. As you speak about energy, uh, oil is trading maybe an average of about $65 or thereabouts a barrel. Uh, given the budgeted price for oil uh, in the budget last year, there are some who may be considering or thinking that, look, right now the government is making money, trying to be with making money. Uh, how do you respond to those who are questioning whether, in fact, the country is now making more money off of these higher prices now, but yet the concern that the economy is stalled and things are just not happening as they should? The answer was actually given in the energy spotlight. One of the areas that was addressed by the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Energy officials is we in Trinidad and Tobago believe that just because there's an increase in the price of oil, it means an immediate economic bolstering of our revenues, etc. It simply doesn't work that way. Two things, oil, we're less dependent on oil than we are on gas. When you look at the gas prices, also our gas prices are fixed. So there has not been that immediate direct correlation between the higher prices on the international market of oil and the economy of Trinidad and Tobago being immediately revived. Having said that, the Minister of Finance has reported that he expects that things are, he thinks things are getting better, he knows things are getting better because of course there will be an increase in the amount of taxation, etc. But it is not this massive immediate opening and flooding of money into the economy. So things are getting marginally better. We continue to monitor the situation, but one of the whole purposes of the energy spotlight was to educate the population on it, but also the meetings that the Prime Minister is going to lead us in next week with BP and Shell are to increase the revenues and the cash flows for the government and the people of Trinidad and Tobago. All right, I'd like to, any one last question and then I'd like, yeah. Um, I was wondering if the Attorney General briefed um, the Cabinet today about the outcome of the deliberations on the anti-gang bill last night, um, because apparently it passed, but the opposition today is claiming that the government slipped in a few things into the bill, such as some supposed provision to deal with corruption and public office. Um, if that is in fact the case, and the bill obviously was amended, so it will have to go back to the House. So. Is the anti-bill in jeopardy of falling again? Again, no, the Attorney General did not spend any time briefing us. Um, we had some cursory and, and superficial level of discussions as to what took place in the Senate there yesterday. I think it's, it's very easy to do a comparison between what left the House and, and what was eventually passed to see if there are any changes along the lines of what you've suggested and where that would have come in in the proceedings essay, this is done in an open and transparent manner. So I'd be very surprised to, uh, to understand factually how something can be just slipped in without the opposition knowing, because they would have had to have participated in any amendments being made yesterday. But again, this is something I'm sure the Attorney General can and will address. Confident that anti gang bill is now ready for full implementation. Well, it has to go back to the House because, as you say, there were a number of amendments. So, when there are amendments in the Senate, it must now come back to the House. As a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, and as, as, as you members of the media are as well, I would continue to look on with um, my breath held to see what is the position taken with the final debate on this legislation. We really need it. We've heard the police service say time and time again how useful an asset this legislation will be in the fight against crime. And I hope that the opposition continue to hold to their word 
as they've done because it's been passed in the House, it's now been passed in the Senate, it's back to the House and that's been done with the support of the opposition. I hope now with this last round that they will continue to support it. All right, I'd like to thank you all very much and um, wish you all a good rest of the day. Thank you.